ค่ะยูเวลคัมคือ um, grab a drink at Doreen Chan's work and it is part of her work and I think it's really fun for for a web face exhibition opening Oh yeah, I can have a drink as well. Hi, feel free to linger around. Um, feel free to linger around. As for those who are not very familiar with Destin Gallery, is amazing platform where uh, social interaction is allowed while we are looking at artwork and interacting with artwork online. Hello, everyone. I'm Kyle Chung. I'm the uh, chairperson of Video Touch. I want to give you the warmest welcome to this opening event for Foundation's finale exhibition. The project is organized by Video Touch with our platform partner, Distant Gallery, which is where we are gathered here at the moment. What's really exciting here is that we are really treating this as a venue, an alternative venue. Uh, for exhibitions, an alternative platform for exhibitions. I sincerely hope this shows the experimental spirit in Video Touch's programming for years to come. For now, for this very special moment, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Distant Gallery for this wonderful platform. And I need to also thank the fellow curators, Angel Leung and Lisa Park for putting all this together I would also like to thank the Hong Kong Arts Development Council for their generous financial support to this program. Without them, this project would not be possible. For, uh, of course, I have to thank all the participating artists, researchers, labs, and speakers. Foundation is about connecting people from different sectors to explore and experiment. That is what's happening right now. I hope you can feel the energy in the air through the internet. We're connecting, we are exploring, we're experimenting right at this moment. So, um, well, I hope you enjoy this event today and uh, thank you very much. Um, do I say something briefly? Yes, please. Yes, yeah. please, I'll give you the floor. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to thank uh, everybody at Video Touch. Also, thank you to um, for this uh, uh, a beautiful speech, of course, but also uh, especially uh, Lisa. We started this uh, a trajectory with. Um, I think uh, we're incredibly happy as this in gallery to be able to um, collaborate on this uh, exhibition and on this platform, on the use of this platform. Um, do when um, during the first lockdowns um, this platform started and we started to build this platform and to imagine that we would arrive here and that the energy that we imagined that it would be possible with an online initiative uh, to see that actually in use in such a way is a dream come true. Um, so we're incredibly proud to be uh, to be a part of this and uh, to be able to support this and to be able to. Um, yeah, make make sure that uh, all these things happen. Um, for example, the wonderful idea to uh, obtain a drink during the exhibition. Um, and I look forward to uh, the rest of the event um, a lot. Uh, Distant Gallery has like, um, check it out for the rest of the programming and the other shows. Uh, we just opened a show with Lorna Mills. We're very, um, very happy that um, that we got to work with uh, Videotage and uh, we hope to um, I'm personally looking forward to a beautiful program today. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the event. Stan and Kyle for the beautiful speech. Um, I'm Angel, I'm a joint creator of Video Touch and also co-creators with Kyle and then Lisa for Foundation. Um, Foundation were initiated in early 2021 when the world was talking about NFT um, and the art scene. 
And over the last two years, I believe we all know what happened then. We have witnessed the fast-paced development and fluctuated popularity of different internet technologies, from VR like like a few years ago to an NFT, and then later metaverse to recently AI. While these technologies are rightly discussed in different fields, we felt there was a missing piece about what the changes mean to people who work in contemporary arts. Um, with this idea in, ha in, in our head, uh, we want to generate more meaningful conversation and collaboration about uh, we want to generate more meaningful conversation and collaboration about art and technologies. That's why we came up with Foundation, which is a web-based media art festival about web free technologies. Uh, it started with a panel discussion in September 2022 with five internationally in acclaimed and amazing art and technology experts, including Dr. Lev Manofish, Ms. Priscilla Kukui, uh, Dukai, Dr. Alfaro Casinani, and Dr. Melencia Padilovsky. Some of them are also participated in the exhibition today. And I think I think many of them are also here today in the opening. Um, and then we pair up three Hong Kong artists and labs to work together for research and commission works, including Koi Chuk and Liu Chong from AM Lab of DTU for Extended Reality, Liu Jami and Dikai from HLTC of UST for Artificial Intelligence, and Fistin and Dr. Damien Shahiera from LISF of CTU for blockchain technology. The results are astonishing, and you can see the artwork here uh, revealed today. Furthermore, we have included 12 more artworks under the topic of the exhibition and a keynote speech today to widen the conversations that we really are aim and strive to, to broaden. Um, so here, I will pass the time to my co-creator, Lisa Park So Young, to talk more about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angel. Can you guys all hear me okay? I gotta jump. Yeah, thank you. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna start a little discussion about the design element and then I'll introduce Dr. Lev Manovich for the keynote speech. So looking at many NFT marketplaces and exhibitions these days, um, it becomes more evident that those that don't focus tightly on the products and their price with a prominent button for purchasing the end products Moreover, they rarely offer live awareness and communication with other people who are on the same site who are possibly looking at the same artwork. This is somewhat understandable from a business perspective because NFT art on the web as a system is still in its infancy. And given the problematic state of web sociality as it stands, the risk is too high for businesses to open this Pandora's box. The online echo chambers too easily blow sentiments out of proportion. Habits of fundamental attribution error deepen social division among people. And too many exploit the anonymity of the web to act unethically or render themselves invisible behind the veil of the virtual. But Web3 cannot happen without communities. So there's a critical need to rectify our social presence on the web as we progress into this new future. This, however, is often relegated to the many proto-metaverse platforms, which is again still in its infancy. These platforms require its audience to own very expensive and still too clunky VR devices, as well as a high performance gaming lab computer. So the accessibility is still very limited. So what do we do as we are suspended between the web with all its problems and a future metaverse that is still struggling to develop into a mature and accessible ecosystem? Given this context, we are so excited to work with this new gallery, which prioritizes socially, sociality and building of new relationship between people from disparate regions and cultures upon the context of the art world that comes with a degree of creative freedom most disciplines lack. We came to realize how the strategic direction of an organization manifests not only in what, but in how the processes and interfaces are designed and implemented, which invisibly shape what we can and cannot do in a certain space. Therefore, sociality, interdisciplinarity, and diversity became our mantra throughout. We try to convey the critical coming together of the art, science, and business communities through a circular formation on some of the segments you will see in, the web, in this web page, as well as through the selection of diverse art practitioners and creators. We also refrain from over-designing the site in order to not flatten the individual nuances of each artist and their layout preferences. 
We also gratefully received designs and ideas from everyone involved to pull these eclectic elements into a whole with minimal design intervention in view of decentralizing the processes of creation. If you're used to a very clean layout that follows the good design principles, our website would feel weird. This discomfort is intentional and partly realistic constraints because it is when we are faced with the unusual that we can examine normalized conventions that have silently become invisible moderators of what is possible. It is through new and unconventional paths that we can rethink the normal. With all this in view, it makes complete sense that we have Dr. Lev Manovich presenting this keynote on Distant Gallery today. Having been in dialogue with Lev throughout the process, we found many convergences of values, such as the full embrace of social media and various other internet platforms to progress open and critical discussions in the real world. Um, the cross-examination of our technological milieu, both as a renowned theorist, as well as an artist, culminating in one person, which allows for a deeper experimental uh, endeavor of all processes involved in one person. Dr. Manovich has been theorizing and making artwork in the new media space for at least four decades, maybe longer. His passion evinced in the sheer number of works produced and the energy and the warmth he puts into his diverse endeavors. We're very grateful to have our keynote speech from Dr. Lev Manovich today, and we thank each and every one of you in the audience who are here to experiment with us. Now, Dr. Manovich, please come join us on the stage. Great. Um, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, so I want to thank Lisa uh, for all her support and for dialogue with me and putting up with my frequent frustrations. <laughs> um, um, I am at the kind of stage of my life where I could have retired, but I just can't do it. Instead, I'm transitioning to another stage where I'm trying to integrate uh, the first 30 years of my life uh, where I was an artist and then the next 30 years where I was known more as a theorist and now I'm trying to combine it and it wouldn't really happen without a few close friends and maybe without Lisa, most importantly. I also want to thank people uh, who created this gallery. Right? It is very challenging to go against the norm, to go against the mainstream interfaces. Uh, the beautiful statement Lisa just read about uh, the intentional difficulty. Lisa, I wish you read it to me like months ago when I would never complain. I just came up with it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, well, it should be like it should be placed as a big epigraph, right, on the on the stage. And I also want to thank, uh, with all my heart, the people of Videotage. Uh, maybe not all of you know, but Videotage is is the is one of the oldest, maybe the oldest media art platform in Asia. It started in eighty six, um, and uh, you know, being being around kind of media art for a long time. Uh, I can't even imagine how it is possible to run uh, a vib vibrant, uh, networking, honest uh, uh, art center for so many decades, right? So it takes amazing people. You guys are really in inhuman. Lev, yes? just one second. I got a message that uh, some people cannot hear the speaker. Okay. Uh, can Yeah, can you just, okay, if you do not hear the speaker, can you jump up and down, please? Everybody. Okay, just a few of us, not everyone. That means those who are jumping up and down must do a hard refresh. I'm sorry. Whenever there's a problem, please hard refresh your browser. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm not. So, I can hear left fine. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I'm now going to you know share the screen. Uh, let's and then I'll explain what the talk will be about. So let's start. Okay. So click. Okay, okay, just a moment. Okay, let me position myself <laughs> here. Okay, right click, start sharing the screen. Okay, just a moment. Sorry, guys, it's always a bit challenging. Okay, ta -ta -ta. okay, entire screen, share. Okay, uh, okay, and um, you want me to also move my avatar, right? Mm. right okay. You can come uh, uh, in a place where we can see you, maybe yeah. around. Uh, she was okay. Yeah, she was okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Wow. I'm finally, finally after so <laughs> much, so much. I got it. Okay. So uh, you should be seeing um, the interface of Adobe Lightroom, uh, where I'm collecting, editing my images. 
Um, so the talk is a uh, experimental. I only started to give his talks last fall. This is one of the first times I'm doing it. Um, so I'll be talking about my art, my images, which span 45 years, uh, in which include drawings, pen on paper, etchings, watercolor, color pencils, also uh, recent drawings done on the iPad using different iPads. And of course, um, images created in the last eight months using stable diffusion and mid-journey version three and four. Um, so uh, all the images you see are mine and uh, some images that I said, you know, are from 40, 45 years ago, they're drawings, there are also a few drawings which are very recent. Uh, and I will point out when they are drawings, but if I don't say anything, when these are all my selection from uh, 10,000, <laughs> of mid journey uh, images I selected and edited during the last eight months. And uh, because you know, time is short, I'm actually going to read part of the text. And uh, in this text, in my short talk, um, I want to address kind of two topics. One is I want to draw on my experience of growing up and uh, developing as an artist in the totalitarian, uh, highly controlled society uh, you know, so-called communist society, which was USSR, Russia in the 1970s, um, and perhaps talk about some of the strategies me and others have used uh, to make meaning, uh, to have a kind of inner immigration, to escape these controls. I mean, of course, there are other strategies, but this is something me and I think many people not only of my generation, but many people throughout the 20th century, uh, the strategies people use. And I think this is the reason I want to talk about it is I think that it's becoming very relevant again. So since the war started, but even before me and my friends in Russia and outside have watched in horror uh, how Putin is kind of turning the clock. And Russia today is in many ways very similar to the communist totalitarian society where I grew up in the 70s, but also, as we all know, uh, in the 90s, it was with excitement, you know, that we left the horrors of 20th century behind, and uh, now we can build in less hierarchical, more inclusive, right, more uh, open world, but 30 years later, we definitely see uh, a significant return to uh, totalitarian, authoritarian, right? Very controlled societies. It's happening in a number of countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of you, you know, are living or will, will be living in these societies and we also don't know what the future of America is. So I'm thinking that perhaps some of my experiences can be relevant today. And uh, the second topic is of course, the AI revolution, right? the evolution of revolution, uh, which started already in the 60s, the first computer tools, which were already smart. But today we have a new generation of uh, AI tools, so-called generative media. As you know, GPT-4 GPT was released this week, and so is a new journey version 5. Uh, and I'll have you know, some things to say about it, but again, not purely as a theory, but rather in the context of my own attempts, my own experiments, to use these tools as a way to kind of come back and to continue uh, artistic practice and doing very personal works, uh, something which I put on hold like 30 years ago. So this is some of my mid-journey images I did this fall uh, with very particular static and very particular content. I grew up in Moscow in the 1970s he began painting at the age of 12. Okay. Let me see if I can show you some of these works so you know where I'm coming from. Okay, it's a bit difficult. Okay, just a moment. Okay, okay, here we go. Oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. Oops, okay. Um, okay, here we go. Da, 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 da. Okay, not here. Okay, sorry, maybe it is here. Just a moment. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so for example, this is a portrait of my mother, which I drew right in real life 
using pen on tracing paper. Okay. And, um, and then, uh, so this is the kind of skill I had already at the age of 18. And then um, if I find it, there's another drawing here. Maybe I can find it. Um, maybe I can find it. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, um, let's, okay, let's continue. Um, Okay, um, and then uh, you'll explain in a second, you know, so I basically made thousands of works and then we applied for immigration and then we're given this permission and this immigration can completely destroyed my family, but that's another talk. And then as soon as we left Russia in 1981 and we're on our way to America, I started to make kind of new drawings and I couldn't remake really these drawings before because they wouldn't allow me to take them out of the country because the drawings would be considered to be anti-government. Uh, in a way, trying to represent symbolically and visually my understanding, my experience of living in this kind of society. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in the Moscow in the 1970s and began painting at the age of 12. My, my teacher showed me reproductions of Giorgio Morandi works and told me that he is my ideal modern artist. This is how I still feel today. Other artists I admire are, include Kaim Sutin, Alberto Giacometti, Robert Hark, and Alexander Drevin. I grew up in a late communist society permeated by ideologists in meaningless slogans. The art in this society was intended to represent the ideologists and aid in the construction of ideal communist future. I.e., the art had to be inherently political. So this is why I hate political art, because it was the only art which was allowed to be uh, you know, when I was growing up. So never could reproduction of abstract art be exhibited or published, but still lives, landscapes and portraits with more traditional representational art subjects were permitted. Representing such subjects using the visual languages of modernism or simply evoking the feelings of sadness or melancholy became the act of resistance and method of immigration for tens of thousands of artists who lived in a communist societies kind of controlled right by Moscow in the second part of the 20th century. In the art of Morandi, he continued painting his quiet right, kind of inner worlds. Uh, uh, when Mussolini came to power, so he continued painting his works in fascist Italy can be interpreted in the same way. So to be political doesn't mean that you represent particular ideologies or you oppose you know, particular ideas openly. Uh, to be political, in my experience, is to in fact refuse open politics, refuse keywords, refuse creating art, which can be reduced as keywords or which simply represent uh, popular ideas. Okay. So today I aspire to create works of art with the woke subtle feelings, emotions, moods, and non-verbal meanings that can be expressed in words or reduced to keywords, slogans, or ideologies. So now I will switch to uh, my you know, recent work done with AI tools. It's just a way to continue, okay, which I already started. Uh, I'm interested in atmospheres. So it doesn't move. Okay. Details, the flaws of the world as it is, as opposed to the perfect idealized world that so many strive for. But at the same time, right, while I declare in my kind of artist statement that I want to be outside of politics, meaning, and semantics, uh, inevitably I come back to you know, this iconography of this late communist society uh, and certain feelings of nostalgia and melancholy. So there's a very complex feelings I have, right? On the one hand, 
you know, communism killed more people in the 20th century than any other type of society, right? I mean, hundreds of millions of people we killed in Russia, China, and so on. On the other hand, this is the society in which I grew up, right? I grew up in Moscow in the 60s and 70s. That's where I had my first love and my first attraction and my first sex. This is where I discovered Morandi and the amazing feeling of creativity. So I have this very complex love-hate relationship, right? To uh, uh, my youth and to uh, this kind of society because precisely by not allowing anything, right? It's created incredible interests. So people in the societies were in a way more intellectual, right? We love books, we love avant-garde poetry much more than, uh, let's say, people outside because precisely it was not allowed and precisely because it was so difficult to get these books. Anyway, um, so at least in my head, even though, as you can see, I can't get away from it completely, I aspire to create works of art that evoke subtle feelings, emotions, moods, and non-verbal meanings that can be expressed in words, reduced to keywords, slogans, or ideologies. Uh, I'm, inter right? I'm interested in atmospheres, details, and flaws of the world as it is, as opposed to a perfect, idealized world that so many strive for. At the moment when authoritarian and populist ideologists offer simple answers to complex questions and artificial intelligence often privileges stereotypical rather than infrequent and popular, the values of complexity, subtlety, nuance, alternatives, uniqueness, and dialogue needs to be defended. This is why I think of art, which has these values, as political. So for me, something which is subtle, something which is undefined, something which is beautiful, something which doesn't represent any particular idea, and something which can be you know, uh, reduced to illustration of popular you know, or good ideologists or bad ideologists, potentially this is real political art. Uh, so what I want to do is to whisper rather than to be loud, to be uncertain rather than too certain, to enjoy light rain rather than hot sun, to make art with us indirect rather than too obvious, to celebrate neighbor positions, no hierarchy, no rhizomes, to never use idiotic terms such as identity. I mean, I'm a Russian Jew, I'm an artist, I'm a son of particular parents, I can name my identities. We don't define me uh, in any, you know, in any strong way. So this focus on identity politics, I think, is really fascist. Um, I want to stay still and let the world run through me. I want to refuse defining things. Um, now, this is, you know, what I wrote. Then Lisa asked me to write an artist statement, but as you saw, it's not so simple because in many of my recent uh, AI image series. In fact, I'm coming back to particular iconography, to particular semantics, to particular aesthetics of this kind of late communist society. But at the same time, uh, you know, these works are, have been created since the middle of summer of last year, right? When we were all shocked by the terrible, unjust, uh, in the worst tradition of 20th century war, which Putin started in Ukraine and uh, destroying his own country, destroying you know, peace in Europe and so on. Uh, so partly with images, I think also represent the feeling which I and some of my friends had when it was started, we were so shocked that we felt immobilized, right? We felt you know, kind of frozen, right? You know, we felt that we can't move, right? So in my case, maybe uh, this kind of feeling somehow evoked also something I like from a Russian childhood, which is winter. And uh, these are some images, you know, I was creating. So these images uh, in the same way, right? They maybe speak of the feeling of horror of war, but they also speak of my, again, childhood experience of living in communism, where everybody was playing a role, right? Where, you know, you go outside, you can never say publicly what you think, uh, you know, foreign books were not available, abstract art was not available, you couldn't immigrate. Uh, there was no internet, web, there was no common gallery, right, or Zoom. And uh, 
when I was 10, I remember I came home to my parents and I proudly said, okay, guys, I finally got it. They said, what? Well, all this communist ideology, right? This is just a theater. It's just theater of absurd and we're performing in it. Which is, my parents laughed and said, finally, you understood. You know, because before when, when we were you know, telling each other political anecdotes, you were very upset when we complained about Soviet government, you know, Communist Party and so on. Right? Um, so uh, I will show you, you know, I don't want to take all the time. Uh, I'll show you and comment briefly on a few of the series I created again with AI tools in the second part of last year as direct or indirect comment, right? Or rather representation of my state, my feelings, my emotions uh, in the year of 2022. So 105 years after communists came to power and, uh, you know, 31 years after Soviet Union collapsed. And now, you know, the ex-communist, the ex-KGB, right? Putin completely continues the methods. His propagandists continue propaganda techniques, which were even worse than what I experienced in the Soviet Union. So these are his feelings. And at the same time, mixed, right, with my desire to create art, which is not ideological, which is opposite of NFT art, right? With kind of RGB, EDC of, you know, dancing, dancing cubes and, uh, you know, board apps. Uh, and uh, the opposite of so much of digital art, uh, which is, can be wonderful, but, it, but it's opposite of modernist subtlety nuance. So I'm kind of trying to use AI against the green and when I say that, it's not just the empty words, uh, because uh, as I researched, and but you also can see it if you use these tools. For example, Mid Journey, right? When we release a new version, it has a kind of default language, right? So if you don't specify any visual statics, any cinematography parameters, you know, it tends to represent things in a particular way, very cinematic way, very dramatic way. And that's why people are Mid Journey. Was in the case of stable diffusion, it was a model was trained on the data set of a few billion image and text pairs and fine tuned on the subset of this data set, which was uh, uh, okay. uh, rated by the computational model, which tried to simulate the popular aesthetics. So images which are more you know, clear, right? More communicative, more uh, let's say commercially beautiful, get high ratings. So it takes quite a bit of work. It's a real challenge to get with AI tools at the moment to create something which is more like the aesthetics and iconography, which I liked since my teens, something which is quiet. It is possible, but you have to work a lot. And I feel very uneasy about these images because you know I like them. And in some ways they're better, right? They're better images of what I can draw today. At the same time, I worry with certain kind of values, right, of this too clear, uh, too uh, efficient communication, the popular taste, right, the uh, art, uh, art station, DVD art, Hollywood, video game aesthetics is still slipping in, right? Um, so again, I'm trying to represent something which is symbolically refers to my childhood and to this kind of winter, which comes and goes in Russian history. And in the same time, this image right of a stage. And I guess only later, I'll see the results. So very briefly, just show you a few things in comment. Um, so this is uh, a project, which I also, a series I did in the fall. It's now going to be exhibited in uh, St. Petersburg. And it's called the Library of Non-Written Manuscripts. So the idea is that in the 20th century, and of course today, when people live in this kind of societies, uh, sometimes, you know, we write manuscripts or now type, but we you know, we only share it to a few friends, right? And in the, during Stalin period, people wouldn't be even afraid to write them down. You know, some of the greatest Russian poets would write poems. And then let's say we're, uh, we're relatives or we're friends would memorize them. And only decades later, right, would write them down. But I think more generally, you can say that what's in the libraries, what's in the museums is a kind of art which was realized. But I think the, the best art, the best inventions, the best writing, right? The best human creations were never realized because for various reasons, people never wrote them down. We were in prison, we didn't have a means, we were afraid of the government. So I'm imagining this kind of library of these half erased manuscripts of, you know, but of books which were never completed and in fact never written down.
This was Dummy Journey version four. Um, and then uh, some images I did. Again, we're more directly referring to the situation. This is uh, uh, called like, Russia after a long war. Uh, so I hope it doesn't happen, but we don't know at this point. Um, right? I also come, you know, was coming back to this idea of a stage, right? Where we're no longer, we're not, we're not quite sure if we're on stage or in reality. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, this image of kind of frozen winter stage of winter world. Uh, yes, Lisa, I'm going to finish in a few minutes. And then um, I also was interested in the way these new AI tools can be used as a memory machine. And of course, the ability to represent the past directly depends on how much data from particular moment or culture were passed as in the database. Uh, it also depends on the particular tool, how it was fine-tuned. So in version three of Midjourney, when I ask it to like make images of Russian high school students in Moscow in 1977, we did something which to me feels quite right, even though there was anatomical right, problems. Uh, but when I did the same thing, you know, in the newer version, you know, we became too perfect. This is also from last fall. This is from kind of stable diffusion, and it was making lots of anatomical mistakes. Uh, but in, so in order to mask them and also to create a particular mood, I would kind of you know, use some fog effects, right? Some uh, decreased clarity in Lightroom, uh, again, to create these images of Russian youth, uh, maybe perhaps today or perhaps a few years from now, and uh, this seemingly dark period, which is every day is getting darker and darker in Russia. Uh, and then, uh, something right a bit similar in mood but maybe a bit like science fiction maybe this can be illustrations to draw over 1984 uh, and like most of my i think like all my most successful ai images is the result of a mistake where ai misunderstood what i was trying to do uh, so now i can imagine writing some kind of dystopian fiction right where teenagers uh become presidents of a country, but only for one month. And then we use it to eliminate their enemies or something like this. Um, and uh, you see, and then this is another uh, attempt to reconstruct a kind of memory, right? Uh, of my, of my you know, childhood, people in the bus in Russia, but this is the last thing I'm going to say. So I want to come back to this idea of kind of bias and the idea of a kind of trade-off. You now have with these visual AI tools, between how beautiful the image is, how precise, how spatially correct it is, and it's, it's a stereotypical nature. So it's, I think now it's maybe been corrected a little bit in version five, but the version four of the journey um, is that there's a parameter called stylized, so dash S, and it can go from zero to 1000, and the default is 100. So if you put this parameter to a high number, right, you get image which is more beautiful, more cinematic, especially coherent, but also more stereotypical, right? These are obviously not the normal people, right, in a bus. That's like a very kind of Hollywoody uh, movie about Russian people on the bus, right? Everybody looks too perfect, you know, very real characters and so on. Uh, so I don't remember what parameter I used, but, you know, so sometimes, sometimes, right, I would have to uh, kind of use uh, the parameter, which would be S0, and the images would be not as complex, not as detailed, but we would be more precisely correspond to what I wanted to do. I think in version five, it probably changed. Um, and finally, uh, I will finish here. So periodically, I'm trying to see if these tools can really imitate me. And I will be, I will be happy if we do, because when I can fully retire and, uh, and I can have GPT-4 write my theory, which also doesn't work yet, and I can help me journey uh, do my drawings, but at least at last time I tried, right? So this is my original drawing from maybe 1981, 1982, you know, and I tried the stable diffusion in the journey, uh, and that's what it did. And superficially, it looks like my drawing, except it couldn't figure out what these objects are. And this is not because I'm original, I'm great artist, not at all. It's simply that my, my drawing, my style with all these imperfections is just not common enough in the data set of billions of images online, right? So that didn't work. Uh, so when I said, I'm going to write, that's another attempt. So when I said, I'm going to erase mm -hmm. part of the drawing, 
in C clouds in the style of Rembrandt, right? So it works much better, but how do I feel morally about having computer simulate Rembrandt to add to my drawings? I don't feel very good about it. So here we are, right? And this is just, of course, one of many paradoxes of digital culture. Um, so I hope it all made some kind of sense. Thank you so much. And forgive me if it was a bit too disjoint and experimental, but, um, you know, I finally realized what fun it is to give artist talks because you can show your images and discuss them and not propose a single linear narrative. And, uh, you know, uh, you can have dialogue with me, of course, here on Facebook and Instagram where I'm posting ideas and images. And I'm very glad to participate in this and looking forward to mingling and uh, uh, promoting this exhibition. So let me go back and say stop streaming. Okay, what is it told me? Okay, just a moment. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay, and oh, oh. sorry, Lisa, try to. Okay, <laughs> done. Okay, right? Okay, done. Okay, thank you very much for this talk. Um, it's, it's very enlightening to see the in, inner kind of workings that goes on. Actually, I found it very interesting to look at your artworks uh, sort of being posted on Facebook and all the discussions that just, you know, just picks up, like, you know, and I found that very, very meaningful for theorists and scholars to be engaging with everyday, you know, like people, right? And I think that's super important. And also what I found was that in the beginning of the, uh, well, in the, I found that a lot of your images were very bleak and very depressing. And I was like, oh, it's left going through like a difficult period. I was a bit worried. But then again, it was because all the trauma was being fleshed out by the war in Ukraine. It, like it all like triggers these like pain points that you've had based on your life. And like it's, you know, very often you're responding to an old trauma when I, you when you see a similar situation sort of unfolding. And I think those are really, really important because those are entry points for us to sort of think about the future based on the past experiences. And this has to be done as a collective discussion of a group because one person may be too biased, right? So when you do a social sort of discussion together, it really makes the context and the trauma relevant for today's day. So really appreciate hearing the entire story of uh, your time in Russia all the way to now. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, uh, I just had to say that, but I'm gonna open up the Q&A microphone right now. So if anybody has, uh, oh, uh, it's right there, open already. You, If you follow my face, the microphone is right here. So if you step in that space, you can ask the question. So if any of you guys wanna ask any question, please step in. And if it's not loading properly, just hard refresh. And please feel free to go ahead and ask questions. So I, I was wondering, so if uh, before, you know, while everybody you know, gets in, gets their question ready and positions themselves on the microphone, please go ahead. Maybe I can ask a question first. So if the artificial intelligence that we're currently um, developing is polarizing the world further by, you know, giving more recommendations of the more conventional images, how your model of your child's the child children's faces turn to be more and more model like there is definitely something you know there's definitely some severe level of gaslighting going on in the society right so what do you think the artists can do in this situation when anybody can generate uh visuals on the fly what is the new position the artists may employ uh sure sure well, before I answer that, let me just say literally a few sentences about uh, in response to your earlier remarks that many of my images are big and depressing. You're not the only one who said it, right? And to me, when I started posting these images and I started saying these remarks, I became very sad because I realized that we really kind of, as human civilization, we really lost it. Look at all the great art or all the art you were created for, for centuries and it's, yeah, it's depressing because human life is depressing. What, Shakespeare? You know, Romeo and Julieta, uh, Bosch, Brody, Rebrandt, right? So the fact that today, you know, uh, right, many people around me, including like, you know, I, not, I don't mean you personally, but people like, right, who have university degrees, do art, think that art should be entertainment, think that art should be like RGB colors, and anything else is depressing, that's, 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 that's frightening, right? 
I mean, it means people now live in some kind of idiotic dream, uh, and they can, don't want to face reality of human condition, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, nobody in 20th century would make this RGB art and be considered seriously. Now, if I make something which is black and white or doesn't have significant color, I'm considered to be sad. So, you know, don't take it personally because other people have the reaction, but to me, it means we live in some kind of false consciousness, right? Uh, that while we all, you know, think of ourselves as progressive, it's trying to make the world more equal and open, we don't want to face, right, our fears, uh, the wars, the, the cruelty, we just want to put it all apart. Now, uh, to come back to your actual question, right? Well, I think that, you know, every, every major technology, every media technology, always brought bad effects and good effects, right? Um, and, um, I think if we particularly if we look at media technologies, you know, photography, or for example now uh, AI tools, uh, there is a kind of there is a price to pay for um, you know for the good things. The good thing is, is extreme democratization, right? But everybody, almost everybody, can go and make images, you know, poems, text without having any training, without having any idea you know, how it actually works. And this perhaps creates a feeling of joy. Like, right, I'm a trained artist, so I don't know what it's like for a normal person to use Midjourney or GPT-4, but it probably feels amazing. So we feel very creative. From all point of view, it's a completely false feeling, right? It's ideology, because of course, you're not doing anything. The machine is doing everything for you, right? So what's creative is a machine, not you. Uh, and uh, uh, so what's more important, right? The old culture, uh, which was culture of elites, I mean, how many people read literature in the 19th century, how many people look at Rembrandt paintings in the 17th century, the culture of elites, where people were much more educated, much more sophisticated, uh, an engineer 70 years ago would write much better than any PhD in humanities today. People would just, you know, less people got educated, but they got educated better, right? So what's more important? We call the great culture of elites, while everybody else was oppressed and illiterate, or today, the society where people never lived so well, right? I mean, never so many people had this wonderful bourgeois life, refrigerators, TVs, mid-journey, stable diffusion, you know, and uh, giving them this false feeling of creativity, you know, where we create something and it's not high culture, it's stereotypical, but it makes me feel good, right? Uh, and of course, because so many people create this, millions of people can create all this beautiful crap, it becomes completely impossible to find good stuff, right? Because the amount of good people is as small as before. It's like one in a million. But if before, maybe, you know, we had 2,000 artists, now there's, you know, billions of, like hundreds of, tons and tons of millions, right? So what is better, right? Amazing culture, which was only for elite, or more democratic, kind of like RGB, you know, NFT, uh, kind of uh, bad, bad, bad taste, idiotic culture, which is enjoyed by millions. I don't know, right? Uh, I think what this kind of dichotomy, this kind of contrast existed maybe all this. Uh, maybe it's something which already came with literacy. Uh, and what's more important, right? Um, so what artists can do in this situation, well, first of all, you know, they can become better than others and get education, right? Most artists today are uneducated. Most artists have no skills, so we just use machines. This is to me a problem of digital art. Um, and uh, you know, we should get education, we should become good at something, and we should resist all popular ideas, right? So the way I structure my career, I was doing it for many years, when I realized that's what I'm doing now, I'm doing consciously. If everybody says A, I immediately say B, and just see what happens, right? Uh, but you have to be very strong psychologically and morally to do this resistance, but uh, most artists do not resist, right? So most artists kind of follow you know, the same memes uh, as everybody else, they're just different memes. So, so sorry, I'm not being very positive, but after four years in this field, that's the outcome. Yeah, well, we're here to work through all that, right? Sorry. All right, thank you so much for that. I think that was a really big question. So um, I think we have some people who are waiting to ask questions. This, uh, live. I think we can start with Cesar Harada, one of the artists who will be represented in the exhibitions for later on. Thank you, Cesar. Welcome. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, cool. Thanks so much for the presentation, really enjoyed it. Um, with the new technology, the notion that you are looking to um, express certain emotion, and I uh, really enjoy your, your art. 
Um, you are, as you say, you are in the early stage of playing with this technology. Uh, what kind of emotion do you think um, are possible to express with this type of thing that were not possible to express before? You mentioned subtlety. It could be a bit more specific or maybe uh, elaborate. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, I think, you know, that uh, to continue with my theme for today, which has been a bit of a, you know, not not the solution, but a being skeptical, right? Uh, because just because everybody else is so optimistic, so I have to be skeptical. Uh, you know, if you look at the discourse about emotions and feelings in the 18th century, for example, right? The terms people had, the poetry people written, you know, the types of melancholy they expressed, it was so much richer than what we have today, right? Again, we have culture which is amazing, it's 3D, it's stereo, etc. But uh, in terms of categories and concepts and uh, psychological representation, you know, it's very poor, right? We don't have new Proust, we don't have a new, uh, you know, uh, Joyce, we, we don't have new Virginia Woolf. In fact, we're not interested in emotions, we're not really interested in the psychological life, right? We're not interested to continue this discoveries of modernism. I'm not sure why. Um, so, uh, in order to express some new emotions, you have to have them. And first of all, you need to have a language for emotions, which existed in the 18th century. I don't know much about it. Uh, late uh, Grimas, right, who started the uh, kind of structures and structures narratologists, have written late a lot about 18th century discourse on emotions. Uh, but if you really think that this technology can help you to express something which some you know, 7th century Japanese you know, scholar who knew poetry, uh, you know, painting, or who basically was an artist because that's what it took, sorry, in China, right, to be a scholar, you know, but, so some people can express which wasn't already expressed in the 7th century BC. I don't think so, right? I don't think there's any progress in art. There's progress in technology. There's no progress in morality or art. Uh, in fact, you know, and as I said, the number of great people is the same as before. You know, now there are millions of, of mediocre people, so, you know, uh, which is very enjoying it, but it makes it hard to see great people. Okay. Thank you for that response. Uh, I think another Q&A. We're ready for another Q&A. I think Priscilla was uh, nearby. Yeah, it's becoming a harder task, like finding the needle in a haystack. <laughs> Pretty yeah, much what, because of all what, that. Yeah, I think, so, you know, I'm not, as I said, right, I'm not like negative about it. The fact that millions of people have been enabled, right? To make designs, to make songs, you know, to write poems, it is wonderful, you know, and I'm happy for them, right? But if we're looking for these kind of masterpieces, then it becomes a bit harder to find them and to produce them just because, right, we have this echo chamber, right, of the net and social media and, you know, and endless art magazines and the same ideas keep bouncing around, right? So, um, so as I said, right, I mean, it's probably, it's much better to live now than 100 years ago when people didn't have refrigerators, we couldn't go to art museums, you know, most of them would die before age of 35, right? I mean, humans have never lived so long and maybe it's better to have, you know, okay culture, B plus culture for millions than uh, a, a minus culture for 10 people, but something or something gets lost in its progress, you know? So, but I think overall, right, it's better to have millions of people creating some bad art using the journey, but we're enjoying it, so why not, right? I mean, basically everybody today can be Picasso because technology enables you to do that. I think that I actually found the microphone. <laughs> it took Yay! me a while to understand where to stand. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Lev, for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I have um, a question for for you, and uh, I would like to have your your vision and understand. Uh, um, it's true that now everyone actually can create, uh, but I think it's the same evolution that we've seen from technology from before. No one had televisions, and everyone has television. No one had a mobile phone, and everyone has a mobile phone. What's happening when you only had a few person who could take pictures and now everyone has a phone and can take pictures? Sure. Um, so I think it's a normal evolution of, uh, um, I see it more maybe as an opportunity for mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. people having more access to more tools. And uh, I would like to understand uh, what's your views on that, the fact that more people can create and how good it could be. 
Yeah. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And I do think, for example, that a mobile phone, which became connected to the internet, and can also take pictures. I mean, it's a you know, best invention of humanity. Think about all of these board people working in the stores, construction sites, warehouses. I don't know what we did before, right? Probably smoke, cigarettes, calling, killing. So now when we have free time, we can go on mobile phone, right? So you can be living in the worst possible place, in the worst possible situation, and you have this amazing life in the window of your phone. Um, you know, that's amazing, right? Yes, people not, you know, we're not like reading Marx, we're not making revolution. We dream about going and shopping in a wonderful shopping center, and that's good, right? That's what humans should be doing, enjoying themselves. Um, but, you know, um, uh, but here's the thing, right? So I was thinking just today, you know, um, like what's the difference right now? And I say right now because it can change six months from now. What's the difference between this universe created by mid journey, stable diffusion, you know, and you can go to certain websites and find millions of images in the universe of Instagram, right? Because in both cases, you can see how majority of images, uh, you know, tend to be of the same like dozen or half a dozen subjects and the same half a dozen aesthetics. So there's endless little variations of you know, the same stereotypical set. And of course you find something similar on Instagram, right? I mean, pictures of your food, selfies, landscapes. But I think I would probably prefer Instagram just because of, you know, a million people took pictures of the same landscape. Let's say, first of all, we had different points of view. Secondly, this landscape looked different in different lighting. So uh, so when people use the same compositions, the same points of view, the same lenses, and photograph the same things, because these things are real, there's probably more variety in these photographs. Then if you tell me journey, you know, to make a character or to make, you know, a face, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, when you know that in the version four of the journey, people discovered that if you just put any prompt, you just put some gibberish, it, it, basically, it basically creates a you know, picture of a beautiful woman. That's how strongly biased it is, right? That's how strong is default language, which is, of course, not just the language of aesthetics, but the language of semantics, etc. So, you know, I think that's too early to say. And again, version five is different. So it's very difficult and very dangerous to make big arguments, right, about this technology because it is evolving and more and more, you know, people, companies, startups, you know, artists will be playing with it. Uh, but uh, there is something right strange and paradoxical about the fact that uh, it was trained on billions of image and taxpayers and potentially it's capable of incredible diversity, just as the internet, right? The internet can show you most diverse things and yet it's dominated by this ideology of like top, top 10, right? Most trending topics, most trending, etc. cetera. Uh, so I think that we have amazing technology, but I think our society so far did not choose did not choose to use computers, internet, yeah, etc., to to kind of lead us to more diverse ideas. In, in, right? Instead, for whatever reasons, which I can give another lecture to, simplicity, interface, etc., it basically dominated by sort of by uh, sort of pushing people towards the same. And maybe that's what we have to fight as artists, right? So it's not a, like I'm making images. I like them. Uh, it's not it's not great art, but I like them. Uh, but uh, if I would make like art, which would be political, let's say in a different way, uh, would be to uh, try to show how this technology can be used to increase diversity of ideas, diversity of imaginations, and it can be, right? Uh, but but, but, but what, what happened in the last 30 years is completely opposite, right? And that's what I don't like about it, right? I mean, it has this amazing potential, right? There's industrial society, you had to make the same things because that's how technology was. Now you can make a variety of things. Everybody wants everybody wants the same Prada bag, everybody wants the same NFT, everybody wants the same, you know, supported like like a Mona Lisa, right? So that's that's a problem, right? I agree. And I think like those people who are promoting paid likes, like the people message you and they're like, like, you know, all the accounts that I ask you to like, then you'll make a bunch of money. And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's unethical. And then this person said, Why is it? You're making everyone happy. You're giving some people some fun. And she didn't understand. So I engaged in a little conversation on WhatsApp, you know, just random sales telemarketing. So I think in the creation and the curation and representing the artists, we have to represent more diverse, as you've mentioned. But we also have to fight against these paid likes because that's gaslighting, right? Telling the internet that this particular brand has how many likes and most of it is paid. That's really dangerous, sure. right? Because we're gaslighting the public. This is quality work when it's not. It was 
you know, the people who had the money to promote extra stuff, who got, who gets more attention. So we are still being, you know, organized under who has more money in a way. So it's a bit sad, but I think this is a pain point we have to start working towards through our experimental endeavors. Yeah. Oh, I think well, we can have time for one more question while uh, Lev responds. Please, one more last sure. question, please. No, please I, go I, ahead. Just, just a just a thought. I think this again. I see things in a particular way, and I will never say that my view is correct. And I'm looking for conversations, and often I say things which are provocative. But I think this process, it kind of in a way, it's also part of globalization. Where globalization promised incredible diversity. Everybody, everybody's voice can be heard. And instead, everybody wants to listen to Blackpink, right? So, so and again, it's not a simple thing, right? It's not because some people are evil, uh, but as we know what happened the last 30 years, is the importance of like top 10, the importance of branding, uh, the importance, right? Who has more money, but also like everybody kind of wants to look, dress, you know, right, listen to the same thing. I mean, go to Korea where everybody can look, dresses in the same way because that's the latest trend. And then everybody looks the same. Right, and this is in a way, right? In a way, this is it's like it's like a, it's like, a, it's, like a, it's like illustration of what. Else. So I think technology for better for it kind of it kind of you know, it can be it can lead us to different worlds, but I think it's in some ways participates in the same kind of movement, right? Uh, towards certain kind of like uh, towards you know long tail, right? The curve becoming like sharper as opposed to long tail becoming bigger, and uh, that's what we have to fight. Sorry, sorry, I said this. Wow. Sorry. This is so thought provoking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we're at about 4.15 uh, time point. We're slightly behind time. If there's one more question, maybe we can take it while Angel, um, and after this, uh, Angel will be taking you to the research uh, and artist and research collaboration section, which is like slightly in this direction. You can go for, I don't know, a few pushes along that way, then you will be able to see the artist lab uh, collaborations. Do you think we should, maybe if there's one more question, we can receive it. But if not, we can uh, all go to Angel's um, talk. We can just all together move along to this side of the screen and go to the next section. So anyone, so which, any last question? Mm. Which which side uh, away from entrance or which? Uh, yeah, maybe I guess can you, can no you, can more you go and we'll, can you go on? We'll, oh, there's questions. I thought maybe it's, I already took too much time. But... No, it was all very meaningful. So it's, it's great oh. as always. So uh, I guess there's no more questions. So I think we can follow Angel right here. I'm, I'm circling around Angel. So if we can Hi. all okay. follow Angel in this Hi. direction. Thank you, Lev, for this really meaningful and, and inspiring speech. And thank you, Lisa, for hosting the, the speech as well as the Q&A. Um, so now we will start to the, like, the tour part. I will start with the three um, research and commission work. Uh, if you move a little bit, then on the screen, on the left hand side, top left hand side of your screen, you can see like some green dots. It looks like a fish. So if you go to the tail of the fish, it is where we're going to start. Okay, I'm going to move there like slowly. And you can see my dog is in red as well. Yeah. Please note that this website, you navigate it like a PDF. You gotta zoom in, zoom out, go left and right, top and down, just yes. and also yes. uh, yeah, zooming in and out. Yeah. We are here. Please move in all directions. So, hey, we're here. Um yes, I think most of us are here. Thank you. So um in foundation, we started for collaborations, including our four months research. Uh, between an artist and also a university-based lab on three topics, which is extended reality, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technology. So uh, for extended reality, we have pair of Koei Chirk and Liu Chang from the Magnet Materiality Lab at CTU. Uh, and they work together. We do not have any preset of what they want to do. And actually, um, it is an ideal collaboration because Koei um, has no like previous expertise in VR. So uh, in this collaboration, we actually want them to work together and understand what each other are doing and hence like extend each, each other practices. And Koei and Liu worked together, and finally they 
came up with this new word called self-control removal system, uh, which is again, you can download it here. If you follow my head, you can see there's a QR code here. You can also click on it, um, which is an application, which is actually a game where you can interact with this really beautiful sculpture. Um, the sculpture was made by Koei and the application development and is, is done by Liu. And there is actually a team working on the 3D modeling and texture. Um, the idea of this work, uh, Liu is here, so she's, she can give a more detailed explanation about the work. But the idea here is actually they have dived, in, they have dived into a so-so phenomenon or experience that about um, a school, the school kids, what pressure they have been facing, in, including pressure from the parents, uh, pressure from the peer, including bullying. And actually, they have investigated. They, through this work, they would like to investigate and also uh, talk about why such pressure happen, why the students are facing really high pressure from their parents, from their peer, and it is it something quite particular in Asia, maybe because of like the society structure as well. So they have done really, really thorough research about that. Um, and in this game, I, I will let you to let navigate the game, but here we have a demonstration video of the game and also some documentation photos of the game as well as their author statement. Uh, Liu and Koi, I think Koi might not be here, but Liu, would you like to say a few words about, about your collaboration as well as your work? I feel, I think maybe there is a little bit of a issue with her, let me see. Hey. Hi. Um, maybe I can open a gas microphone. Liu, is you have difficulty like turning on the speaker mode, I can turn on a gas microphone for you so you can talk there. Um, where's the gas microphone? Um, or Oh, Liu cannot activate the microphone, maybe. Oh, maybe because um, there's some technical issue with. Uh, Liu, uh, would you mind like refreshing your browser? And then you can activate, like you can allow the browser to use your microphone and camera. And perhaps, um, yeah, actually the game is quite, um, the first time when I play with the game, it is, it is not easy to play, but there are a lot of details if you go into the game and the, like, the pyramid, the pyramid sculpture actually represent uh, how students can climb up the social ladder to the top. And the heart shape sculpture is about, um, as parents, how you can ensure your children being on the top of the society by either investing a lot of money, uh, which represented by the coins inside the game. But you don't have a lot of coins, so I, um, beside investing money, you can, you can press 
or you can push your children to work really, really hard to pass the examination. And so it is, there is a lot of details and there are a lot of context and narrative within the game. Um, if you download the game, you can explore it. And if Liu is not able to, uh, Liu is here. So if you're interested in the game, you can feel free to talk to her. And if Liu, there is some technical issue faced by Liu, perhaps we can move to the next um, work, which is uh, made by Fistin in collaboration with uh, Damien from the Laboratory of Interventions in Skep uh, Speculative Finance, also from CTU. Um, they work under the theme blockchain and Fistin come out with a really interesting card game called Fistins as well. And hi Fistin, uh, Billy and Terence are here. Fistin is a dual uh, artist unit that they work a lot with like physical object merchandise as well. They have their own shop and in this collaboration, actually they have never worked with NFT before. They they make a, they make a I think a t-shirt uh, with NFT, like by saying it as a jerk, but so that's why I think we think it's interesting to pair them up with Damien and the lab to create this artwork using the, and like the blockchain technology. And Fiskin uh, at the end, they came up with uh, a cat game where you will explore more details when you talk to the NPC, which is the eggs here. If you if you put your cursor with the X like floating around, you can actually talk to them, and then we will fill more details about how the games work. And there is also a PDF talking about giving you more details about the cat game. But I think one thing very important about cat game cat game is that. Although it is inspired or you work with the NFT technology, it is a game happening in real life. So you collect the card in real life uh, where you can activate or you can, you can register the number on the card on the internet to climb the NFT, but actually the card works in real life as well. And you can interact with this team as well as other other players of the game and I don't know if you have played have you watched the manga or animation called Hunter Hunter this game remind me a lot of that um Billy and Terrence would you like to say a few words about about your work if can you turn on the the streaming mode as well, or I can try to open a guest microphone, but I don't know where the microphone is right now. I don't know where to place it. Mm. I, actually, they are here. I feel they might also face some kind of care issue, but uh, let me ask them. They're actually here, um, and I think they want to say a few words, but we are sorting out some some glitches. So, but it is really interactive. Um, what they want to show, and and actually, thanks Dustin Gallery, especially thanks Luna for setting this up. Uh, they have tried different kind way to present their work within the space. So there are different elements you can explore here. They have a lounge where you can 
talk to each other. You can meet with other card collectors here. And they have, okay. Yeah, and yeah, and there are a lot of details, a lot of fun things to explore in their in their work. Oh, yeah. Hi, right. hey, yes, Christina here. Hi. We like to say a few things about. The idea behind this work, and is there anything you would like to talk to the audiences? Hello. 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 Uh, okay. okay. Hello. Okay. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the feast in space. So we created a game. Uh, that happens in real life and is based on uh, these cards that you see here in the lounge. And uh, if you want to know more about the cards, uh, you can look at the slides next to the lounge. And these cards, when you play it in real life or if you collect its NFT that's uh, embedded inside the QR code, then you can trigger different happenings in, in the real life, which uh, we come up with all the ideas first. And instead of executing it as a brand, uh, we decided to put all the ideas into form of uh, trading cards. And players of the game, when they purchase the booster pack and they collect various cards, then they can uh, initiate the ideas in real life. And we, as the game masters, will carry it out according to the description in the cards. And actually, you can buy, if you follow my hat, um, you can see actually their shop is here as well. Yeah. So you can buy the booster pack here. The booster pack is, is like physical object you receive a deck of cards yeah and so then from yes the when you when you purchase one booster pack inside there will be three cards and then some of the cards they can be just for collecting some of the cards they can uh you can exchange items that we make usually as a brand some of the cards they cause things to happen in the city and uh, we already schemed a lot of uh, events. And if you want to get hints of what might happen in the game, you can talk to the NPCs uh, inside our space. And from them, you may get hints of what type of cards are inside the collection. Yes, and also, I don't want to reveal too much details, but when the game progress because it is not only interactive between the players collectors and the cards but actually the game would progress when more and more card activated so it is a really interesting um try uh, trying to use nft or blockchain technology within the collectible card which existed like in decades decades yeah and for people who have crypto wallets, they can choose to collect the cards in the form of NFTs after purchasing the physical card. But for the people who aren't uh, into cryptocurrencies and who don't play with NFTs, they can also play with the cards in their physical form. Yeah. Yes. So thank you. Thank you, Fistin. Thank you, Billy and Terrence. Um, let's move to the last commission work thank you thank you so much um let's move to the last commission work the arcana intelligence by liu jarming he collaborated with the car from the human language technology center of the hkust 
So Jamin worked with the topic uh, artificial intelligence, which is a really hot topic right now. Uh, when we started, it is really interesting topic, but not that heated. And Jamin has come up really with a really interesting idea about um, what if, uh, because uh, artificial intelligence in speech is generated words and sentences or even images that we cannot plan or, or, or predict it before the generation. So, and, and also in terms of uh, a lot of, there are a lot of thoughts and, and like worries or excitement uh, provoked by the artificial intelligence that at the, we think it is a higher intelligence than human. So uh, Jamin put up uh, an idea putting the artificial intelligence at the, at the position of God. And he created a fortune telling God through artificial intelligence. So if you click the start button here, uh, some, uh, for some of you, it may take a while to load, but after the loading, you can see a start button. And after you click the start button, uh, you will meet the AI God. And then you can you can ask your question with him or them. Uh, Jamin is also here. Jamin, would you like to say a few words about about your idea and your work? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, I am probably going to repeat something that um, Dr. Madhavish just talked about. I think it's been really interesting to see how fast AI and industry developed last year and people's reaction to it. And I think everybody is talking about ChatGPT and Midjourney, stable diffusion these days. And from my point of view, the attitudes of um, people are very extreme. Um, some of the people think AI will definitely change our life and society. And other people think the results and application of AI on the country show how superior human beings are to algorithm. Um, in general, um, as an artist, I'm not always a fan of edgy technology. In fact, I started my artistic um, practice with photography and videos. And I can see that many photographers now, they feel very threatened by the current trend of AI. But um, in my opinion, I agree that there are a lot to explore about AI as artists, like to use AI as a tool, there's a, there's a lot to explore. So this work I created was based on my obs observation that a lot of people um, who don't research or study in this field, they're enchanted by the ability of AI and they're always trying to see how much um, artificial intelligence assimilate human beings by testing the edge of the ability. They're trying to see how accurate the AI can um, do a task. So in this work, I try to put AI in a new position different from what I just described. And therefore I want to um, create a new kind of relationship between human and artificial intelligence, especially the current artificial intelligence application. So I use pre designed audio and visual, some outdated AI algorithms actually, and some latest AI algorithms. And with them, I hope to create an experience that is both old and new after which you'll be able to understand the technology maybe a little bit more, and also maybe um, understand more about yourself with or without the technology. Yeah, so basically the entire experience is that you, um, the AI God will try to, we try to communicate to you, he will speak to you, and then he will guide you to do something. And then if you follow his guidance, you'll be able to ask a question and the AI God will generate an image to um, respond to your question. It's kind of very similar to um, tarot reading, but the image is real time generated instead of um, coming from a pack of already um, ready-made cut set. Yes, that's all I want to say. Thank you, Jamin. 
Thank you. And and please feel free to talk to the artists like after after the, the whole tour. I think they would be really pleased and happy to talk, tell you more about that. And I think uh, Luna has solved the technical issue, so maybe let's move backward to talk. Uh, to solve the technical issues <laughs> finally so um so this work i collaborated with chloe was uh, inspired by my experience of um school bullying in secondary school so when i after i grew up i'm always very curious why i got bullied um at secondary school is it my fault or any other reason to cause that and um after a lot of research um, on the psychological contributor of school bullying, I found out the main reason would uh, are actually um, the like uh, the like um, in in school like uh, the school school work and the uh, family and the parents' expectation um, on the children actually deplete their self control of their negative thoughts and unethical thoughts. And that's why they try to mm, use bully others to vent their angers. So that's why um, this work is called self-control um, removal system. So it's actually explore um, the educational system um, and uh, how it makes um, the, the teachers and the students in this system um, deployed their ability to control uh, self-control and uh, Chloe made this sculpture using um, university ex exam like uh, the exam paper of university in entrance from mainland China Hong Kong Taiwan Korea and Japan so and also cement um, and uh, this kind of three tired structure pyramid is actually a metaphor of um, um, of the um, the reason why, uh, like, it's it's a metaphor of the uh, status disparity in school, which paved the way for schooling. So teachers always have us higher the the highest status in school, and also some students have good grade in like uh, Asia society are granted with more privileges. So and when they cannot control their anger, and they will use all of this privilege to bully others. Um, and uh, this work use a comb pusher game mechanism. So it's a metaphor like um, the college entry exam in Asia society are um, very fierce competition. And also there, um, the many, there are many ways you can win in this game. And all of this, um, um, all of this way are different way how children in SSI society can succeed in educational system. And the graphic on the left side in the pyramid um, shows the cost of each of the parents' operation. Um, like, uh, mm, yeah, basically that's it. So thank you, Andrew. I think, yeah. Uh, thank you, Liu. Um, this is a really, I, I think I'm really impressed by the research and also the work as well when we talk about how game, how game is for fun, but actually it can game also used to get into more like deep or even difficult question to talk about. I think, I think after we all play the game, we will have an answer about that. Um, now I'll pass the time to, thank you. Thank you so much, Luna. And also thank you, Chloe. Uh, now I'll pass the time to Lisa for the tour about the other trials artwork including in this exhibition. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, everyone, um, for listening. Now, we are going to now break this session up, and we're going to go all the way to the left to Lev's artwork. So are we all OK to move now? So we move in this direction. Let's go this way. <laughs> and then we'll do a, a quick overview of all the artworks that are represented under Foundations Festival. And um, then after that, we'll break for, I know kind of running late, but
then we will break for mingling sessions. So those of you who have time, please feel free to mingle around, stay back and speak to any of the artists that you want to speak to. Maybe after the introduction, all the artists can actually go and stay in their venue or stay near the venue and like people can come up and speak to them. Or maybe you can see their faces uh, in the picture and find them in their eggs. So, so first, let's start with um, uh, Dr. Levmanovich's work right here. So here we see a cross-sectional selection of artworks, which Dr. Levmanovich created in collaboration with various machine learning algorithms. We decided to show the cross-sectional overview rather than individual series in order to represent the width and breadth of various experiments Dr. Manovich has been undertaking, both as an artist and a theorist who's been focused on new media pretty much since its inception. Pretty much since its inception. So screening through these series of works, we can almost sense the internal dialogue happening within the artist, clues to which had been given in the keynote speech earlier on. We encourage you to think through the ideas presented in the text, the personal context from which these insights emerged, as well as the atmospheric mood that emerges in vision. Please feel free to come back later to decipher these intertwining thoughts, ideas, and feelings. And most importantly, please feel free to chat with Dr. Manovich later during the free mingling time. Next, we can go down to Elna's work right below. Uh, I think Elna is here somewhere too. So if uh, you're nearby as well. Um, and if your name is Elena, I think people can come and speak to you. Right? <laughs> so Elena's works are always refreshing and humorous as she continues to surprise her with her fun yet poignant recombination of consumer facing technologies, social conventions and the art world. In this work, for instance, Elena's experimentation is to create a love triangle between her virtual wife device and espresso machine embodying the spirit of chat GPT as well as herself. The relationship between the virtual wife Hikari and Elena, as well as that between the espresso machine and Hikari are presented here on this interface. And the experiment is just beginning, is continuing. It's been going since uh, I think 2021, if I'm not mistaken. So we really love the fact that Elena takes a creative tongue in the cheek approach with AI rather than getting too deep in the nitty gritties of algorithmic programming, which is achieved through interdisciplinary collaboration she undertakes. We also look forward to Hikari's OnlyFans cam show, which will be broadcast here in the near future, because it's almost like Elena is pimping out her virtual wife. Love this concept. I think we have to keep pushing the envelope like this. So next, uh, we have Hui Wai Kern's work. So Hui Wai Kern is uh, distinct in a way, the, the, like the personality, just the aesthetic and the visual is distinct in its still and contemplative, uh, you know, like atmosphere that it creates. Um, in this particular piece, Hui Wai Kern creates a real-time rendered non-Euclidean spaces and alternative representation of space as we are accustomed to. Departing from a very specific scene in Kafka's story in his novel, identifying vast ambiguities that fill the space between established facts. Like you can say, she was here, he was there, but there's so much that's missing in that discourse, right? So Hui's work, using this ambiguities speculates with a glimmer of hope, subtly framing the potentialities that remain within reach, yet hidden under the layers of a priori assumptions that hamper our view. I think a lot of our discussion here today is talking about undoing the a priori assumptions that are actually limiting us rather than, you know, applicable throughout the, you know, throughout time and civilizations, etc. Next, uh, Balon Balon Ijo by Cesar Harada. Alvaro Casnelli and Ola Pamela Cascoa, uh, and um, me, uh, I don't know how to say this, me, Made Dwita Diani. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, Balon Balon Ijo presents a compelling permutation of socially engaged art that embodies the empathic tenet of decentralization um, and community in its very processes, rather than emphasizing decentralization as a transactional logic. Inspired by Balinese philosophy of Tri Hita Karana, which aligns perfectly with the three pillars of sustainability, economic, and social and, and environmental, Balon Balon Ijo presents a decentralized system for collecting and sharing clean, renewable energy among its community members. 
within the system, the DAO's role is to coordinate between the contributors and stakeholders of the system. So I, I would really love to see more artworks that are using NFT and the blockchain network to do these um, better goods to create new processes and um, situations where people can come together and um, benefit ourselves, our actual real life, right? Because our life matters. We live in it all day long. Next, uh, we can look at Hosen Yen's work. Hosen Yen's work explores the intimate materiality of AR through his quirky juxtaposition of contemporary cultural references alongside key texts from 20th century Japanese Kyoto school, which fueled the ideological basis of the nation's role in World War II. In superimposing a disintegrating Gundam mask robot hovering in tense suspension, the line between textual and processual manifestation of wartime ideology is brought into view. Is it possible that the allure of violence and exploitation has shifted silently from our philosophical silos into our everyday playthings? The poetic interplay of imageries, iconographies, and philosophy, which is colliding within the materiality of AR in this work, hits us hard, situating the viewer within the metaphor and pushing, the, pushing us to ponder from within this immersive, visceral experience, where a linearity of time gives way. So if you want to experience this work in AR, you can, um, it's a bit, little bit complicated. You have to download the app on iOS or Android, and then close that app and then snap this QR code right here and it'll take you straight to that work. We also like, uh, there's also a very, very, very cool glitch with this artwork where like you actually get to see other artists who are not even actually represented in our exhibition because of, you know, like real life intervenes and sometimes we get amazing combinations. So you might want to play around with that. You will see a lot of artworks in there, but um, yes, this is Hosunian's work. Uh, now, looking at uh, Scott Hessel's Below Victory, I believe Scott is here. Um, Scott Hessel's Below, Below Victory is a poetic dreaming into the past, buried under the victory of today's civilization. In Below Victory, Hessel's creates a site-specific work based on the old Roman ruins that is laying below the Palace de la Victoire in the center of Clermont-Ferrand in France. My French is horrible, sorry. Taking a ground penetrating radar, Scott's team explored what lies beneath and turned this data set into gorgeous visualizations, obliquely reminding us of the impermanence of civilization, where as human humanity, as organic formation of DNA persists on from one paradigm to another. In this way, this work brings hope as we chart out the next chapter of our global civilization. Even if the civilization ends, humanity will persist. We just have to rectify our value system, rectify our systems so that we can still fit into the new systems that come up, come, that emerge. And I think artists have a lot of role to play in this. Next, Doreen Chan. Uh, Doreen Chan invites us to take the mic and reveal our dreams to those cohabiting the exhibition space at each given time. Designating the subconscious realm of dream as a technology-enabled path through which one finds another person, this work confronts us with the choice of making public a very private moment of our existence. In so doing, the artwork becomes complete through a very specific circumstantial convergence of chance, individual preferences, and the dynamic interplay between the interlocutors. Whether someone decides to go and take a mic or not, and whether who ends up taking the mic at the same time, all of that actually completes the artwork itself. It includes the sociality that is unfolding in real life into the mechanism of its own work. So I find this very interesting and we can learn from this experience. How do we communicate with one another online? How do we coexist online together? Um, next, uh, we can look at Lawrence Lex Idol. I'm going a bit fast, but you can come back to all of these works later on. Um, Lawrence Lex Idol is a full feature bilingual film that will be available from today for two weeks only. I very much recommend consuming this dense, complex, and thought-provoking content at your own time, maybe in the evening, because it contains many chapters within that speculates the various perspectives and artificial intelligence may have in dealing with our humankind. 
uh, switching our perspective from ourselves to another and then to another being altogether is a meaningful exercise in generating a more critical situation awareness as well as to imagine futures forward being empathic towards not only to myself but to others as well as other beings i think is a good place to start in building a new future forward after two weeks period, uh, we will exhibit the game loading screen animation as an NFT for purchase. And you can also listen and purchase the soundtrack for the film itself over here. Uh, but yeah, I really recommend watching this movie. I, I felt like every single, like, uh, well, pretty much every single sentence that was like spoken in the uh, film sounds like poetry. And like there are each and like, there's so many topics in there. Please take your time to explore. Uh, next, uh, we are looking at Priscilla Kukui's work. Priscilla Kukui's brand new work, Enchanted, is a multi-sensorial work. All of Priscilla's uh, NFT works come with a bespoke scent that complements the artwork itself. Of course, when you download the an NFT, you don't get the scent, but it's sent to you separately. So then the work becomes complete when you bring your physical self and your sensorial faculty together with the visual, you know, like visual faculty. So there's that wait period, there's that additional dynamic, but there's also that reminder, the physical and the visceral is so important in our wayfinding exercise. So Priscilla is a feminist pioneering, pioneering in the context of Web3. And Priscilla's work is speculatively imbue qualities that are traditionally associated with women and question these stereotypes within today's context. What does it mean to be a woman? Are these values uh, typically women? Like how do we think of a new performance of gender as we move into the future? Recently, I, I found it very difficult to reconcile how to perform as an Asian female versus how to perform as a non-Asian female. And I realized how much um, stress I've been getting because of this, because I, if I apply, you know, certain logic, it doesn't work in other contexts. And I think as we become uh, more globalized, I think we have to think about how to perform ourselves, how to perform our gender, what is a good way of performing, et cetera. So these are very interesting questions you can reflect through Priscilla's beautiful haikus here. Of course, these works are also NFT, so you can purchase them and uh, a scent will come along with the purchase. Uh, moving on, uh, we're at Constant Dollard's page. Uh, you've seen Constant earlier on. So Constant takes a ludic approach, much like this platform itself, which is uh, Constant's, um, I think, uh, baby, right? Like distant gallery is Constance's baby. So Constant takes a ludic approach, a playful approach in embedding a treasure hunt mechanism into his evolving NFT artwork. Upon finding clues dispersed across social media, festivals, and physical exhibition venues, um, the purchased NFT can evolve in exchange for the investigative labor imparted by the curious owner. So you got to do something. You got to find the treasures and your NFT will evolve. In incorporating chance, unpredictability, and user contributions as key drivers of the artwork's evolution, Dolar experiments with the potential of playfulness in teasing out a convivial vision of decentralized coexistence. We really appreciate the playfulness and the space. You can, you can feel that ethos like breathing throughout the space. So we're very excited and look forward to um, doing more of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, uh, one last note. Uh, so this social experiment was set in motion by Constant um, at Transmedial 2021. And uh, we were supposed to have a third iteration where additional 256 new manifestations were supposed to be dropped, but you know, life happens and it's not always possible. But we look forward to perhaps featuring this actual treasure hunt in the near future. Uh, please have a look. And, uh, and these NFTs are still purchasable from this link right here. Another one uh, next is uh, Carla Chan from Hong Kong. Carla Chan's work is very beautiful. And it's very meditative. Um, Carla presents an exclusive virtual space that is temporarily pegged to the pace and longevity of nature in its incessant transitions. 
so the pace of everything is like generally slowed down and it reminds me of like you know the, the return to the slowness right rendering these larger than life transitions into a digital shadow of reality as unfurling on the virtual space of the internet Tan invites us to participate in this realm of alternative temporality through the act of owning a single instance of the translation, which grants full access to her work in perpetual motion. The work you see here is collated from, I think, like 35 different countries, most populated cities around the world. Uh, I think there's uh, demographics data as well as uh, the weather data that flows in. And you can uh, also purchase different different regions. You can choose data from which country you want to see, for instance. So uh, it's, I guess, like using the technology, getting in tune with nature's pace using technology and meeting at a contemplative space that is going to continue evolving to the future by owning a piece. Of course, if you buy the piece, you would get the frame by default. And also, you can also buy an actual device that displays it, like a real artwork on, a, on the wall as well. So there are different approaches by Carla. The images are very beautiful. Uh, and now we are at um, Kazokuchi by Kanoso, Kato Akihiro, and Masanuki Takemi. Uh, really love this piece. It's, it's very, 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 very it's an NFT piece, it's highly technological, but it's so warm the way it is received. So uh, like for me at least, right? Because it, it evokes like the idea of family, children and um, procreation, all that. So uh, Kazokuchi experiments with concepts of family, blood, bloodlines and procreation within the context of NFT art. In transposing these fundamental conceptual building blocks that underlie all human societies in our real world into the space of Web3, the survival of this artificial system becomes reliant on the collective nurturing by their owners, as well as their built-in chance of procreation. Conjuring our already distant memory of raising a virtual pet in the form of Tamagotchi. I mean, like, I, th I think a lot of us would have already had Tamagotchi when we were like, I don't know, really, really young. So this is like a reminder of that Tamagotchi aesthetic, but it's a Kazukuchi. Kazukuchi brings to question how we may collectively embark on a journey of humanizing our technosphere by asking these questions, by going back to the idea of procreation, family, home. You can purchase um, one of these Kazukuchi families. Um, you can go and purchase through this link right here. Uh, on, let me just come over there. So you can purchase a Kazukuchi from here, then you'll get a house. And this house is all gonna be permanently located within an exhibition space somewhere in the world. It's doing world tours. I think soon they will be open in Poland. Um, so these, Actual Kazukuchis will move around the exhibition venues, but then you get real-time update on the different Kazukuchi families that you have. And also because these Kazukuchi can have babies, okay? So like if one machine goes to another machine, like one house, one family goes near another family uh, and, and captures the RFID at a specific time and a place, right? It can't be just any time, every time, like in real life. So once, once that is done, uh, a, egg is born and then the mother of the family gets to keep that egg and then you can sell it as well so there's a lot of very interesting um metaphors that come into view right from perception to conception there there's so many different cool ideas you can uh, find out on your own so those are our 12 amazing artists that we have represented and i'm i'm so so thankful that our artists, uh, uh, you know, took the time to dialogue and discuss with us. And um, yeah, it, it's been a very meaningful journey. And I can't be more grateful to everybody, to the Distant Gallery, of course, to Kyle, who made this possible, uh, invited me to this project, and then Angel, who's been there, and Myra, and Erin uh, from Videotage. It's just been a great journey. And I think it's the human relations that actually make or break our lives. So I think we should focus more on human relations rather than you know, Oh, someone's jumping up and down. Is that is that a complaint? <laughs> okay, I'm 
<laughs> so I think from now on, it's at 4.59. So we're like one minute left to the end of the event, but then we're probably going to keep this event open a bit longer so we can go and mingle around, talk with people, network. So I'm going to become a small egg now so we can all, yay! Oh, that is clapping. I'm like trying to figure out what is that. So yeah, I'm going to come back to normal egg so I can talk to you again. <laughs>